This is Vic Chopra of Unincarcerated Productions, and you're listening to Justice Delayed. You decide what you want to be when you grow up. It isn't very often that you get to be part of something special when it first starts. But, dear listener, by pushing play on this episode of this podcast, that is exactly what you have done. You're here with me, Cameron Collins, at the beginning of an extraordinary journey. Unincarcerated Productions has teamed up with Jody and Billy Sinclair to create an entire universe of multimedia projects, and Justice Delayed is the beginning of that relationship. So, what is Justice Delayed? This podcast is an examination of the American criminal justice system and prison industrial complex. Each week, listeners can join Billy and Jody Sinclair as they tackle difficult topics and come to grips with injustice, corruption, and human rights violations that result from the retributive justice system we have in place. Instead, Billy and Jody will guide us towards a vision of restorative justice. In this two-part introductory episode to the podcast, you will meet our hosts, authors Billy and Jody Sinclair, as they tell their amazing, inspiring, and harrowing love story in their own words. When TV news reporter Jody Bell ventured into the death house at Angola State Prison in 1981 to report on the death penalty, she never imagined she would fall in love. But when she met award-winning inmate journalist Billy Sinclair, that's just what happened. What followed was a 25-year battle to free Billy from a corrupt system filled with scandal and injustice. A joint collaboration between Unincarcerated Productions and Grindle Industries? This is Justice Delayed. I was born into a privileged life in Texas. I was raised in upper-class neighborhoods. I had a private school education in the U.S. and abroad. I rode the American dream until my dad fell hard into alcoholism and lost everything. I divorced my first husband and followed my dream to become a reporter. In contrast, I was born into poverty in rural North Louisiana, redneck country. I fell into the criminal justice system at a fairly young age, age 17. Those that I made horrible decisions along the way during that part of my life. The end result of those decisions, or choices, I should say, caused me to spend 40 years in prison. I moved from surviving to a real sense thriving in a prison community. That was accomplished through self-education, self-awareness, and a desire to define myself and not be defined by the criminal justice system. You know, people ask other people, well, where did you meet your husband? And some people would say, well, at the country club, or I was at a fraternity. Well, I met my husband in Louisiana's death house in 1981. I was there to cover an upcoming execution at one of the nation's bloodiest prisons. At that time, March of 1981, I was still serving a life sentence. It was out without the benefit of parole. And I had become an award-winning prison journalist. I was co-editor of the prison's news magazine, The Angulite, and I was there in a death house doing research for a story that I was working on for the news magazine. And I had been told by the warden that there would be reporters there and that they may want to interview me. And so while I was standing in a death house next to the electric chair, the very electric chair that just a decade earlier was prepared to take my life in Mont Jody. It was really unusual for me to be there because my primary assignment was always to cover the governor and the legislature in Louisiana. Billy and I met in 1981. We married in 1982. And I had to fight for 25 years to get him out of prison because we were facing terrific opposition from the victim's family. And while I believe that victims' families deserve justice, I don't believe in what is called selective enforcement, where someone can reach into the political system and get a much worse punishment for someone compared to another inmate who may have a virtually identical crime. 
1981 and prior to that time, before 1979, inmates in Louisiana served on average 10 and a half years in prison. That was considered the maximum life sentence. After the Supreme Court vacated the death penalty in 1972, the legislature went in, repealed old 10-6 law, and passed new life sentence laws, which had no parole. I knew my case was really politicized. There was a lot of political opposition in the case. Just a few years earlier, I had uncovered documents that really detailed the depth of that political opposition. So when Jody walked in and she and I instantly fell in love, there's no way for, there was no way for her to know what lay ahead. The landscape was barren. I did. And I didn't know if it was exactly fair in the early stages of the relationship to ask her to take that bite out of that apple. But eventually we both did. And we embarked upon a 25 year effort, one we did together to secure my release. And fortunately, over the next 25 years, we were able to do that. But it was not easy struggle. There was pardon board denials. There were denials by the governor. There was a grant of clemency and there were parole hearings, seven in fact, and parole was not granted to the seventh hearing. And through all that, Jody was the line. She steady, constantly, and never once wavered in her efforts to secure my release. He used to call me Baby Lion. I did. He used to write me letters, Dear Baby Lion. I did. It was because she had the determination of a fierce lion. She pursued that one objective, which was to get me out of prison. And along the way, I started getting old and started having health problems. And toward the end, the last couple of years, she wrote me a letter and she told me it's time for you to get on the back of the wagon and let me take it home. And that's what she did. Two years later, I was freed on parole. It was an incredible journey that lasted a quarter century, me and Billy, but we made it. He came home and it proves that the impossible can happen. But to say the least, it takes a little while and a whole lot of work. During that time, there were a lot of trials and tribulations. There were a lot of successes. I was uh, sitting on Nightline, ABC's Nightline with Ted Koppel in 1984 with the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Warren Berger. Jody and I exposed a massive pardon selling operation in the prison system in 1986. I exposed a pedophile ring that involved a federal judge and an incarcerated priest at one of the penal facilities in Louisiana, exposed that. Along the way, we continuously encountered corruption and wrongdoing throughout the system. And we became, I don't want to use the term legendary, but we became, we became well-known both inside and outside the system, as two people who were on a mission like to expose corruption within the system. And we paid a dear price for it. And I will illustrate that in one simple way. When we exposed the pardon selling scandal in 1986, in the wake of that, every inmate who had purchased a pardon, those that chose to violate the law, corrupt the process, Every one of those inmates were allowed to keep their pardons. They went home. I was the only inmate who stepped forward and reported the wrongdoing to the authorities. And I spent the next 20 years in prison because of that decision. The politics also played a role in the period of time that I spent that remaining 20 years I spent. But it kept coming back to that exposure to pardon selling. When you deal with corruption in an organized prison system, and you expose that, you're not only putting your life at risk, you're not only putting your individual welfare at risk, you're making yourself a marked person. And Jody was on the outside. The risk to her was far greater than to me because she was out on the highway coming to see me twice a month. She was so vulnerable 
to the corrupt influences of that pardon scandal. And in the wake of that pardon scandal, they had at least five people that lost their life. Three of them are people who had bought pardons and later decided to cooperate. All three of those people were killed. A Mississippi judge and his wife were murdered because of that pardon selling scandal. Those guys are still in the federal prison system. It was behind that hit job. There was a lot, a lot of money in that corrupt pardon process. And that's what Jody and I took on. Well, when you do that, you make yourself a marked man. So not only was there terrific victim opposition, the victim's family, on top of that, the system began literally, quite literally, to hate us and to punish us at every single opportunity. So over and over again, and Billy would file lawsuits and I would call prison officials, I would call politicians, et cetera, et cetera. But because of the fact that it wasn't just the pardons for sale scam, there were the other issues, the other things that happened that he exposed, one of which involved the secretary of the Department of Corrections. So it's like, you know, you just had a you just painted a target on yourself. But I'll never forget the phone conversation that one evening when the night before I was going to drive over to Louisiana, which was 200 miles one way after work on Friday night, and I was going to go see him. And he sounded so strange when he called and I knew that something was up. So I got to the prison, went into the visiting room, sat down at the table, and he leaned over and told me, he said, Jody, a prison official high ranking prison official told me, he said, you know what? You're rehabilitated and you ought to be out of here, but your lawyer's dragging a leg. So for $15,000, I can get you out of here. I was, <laughs> was, I just couldn't believe what I was, what I was hearing, but we both sat there and, th- and like thought about it. I was looking at him. He was looking at me and he said that he was he by then he'd been locked up 15 years at least. And he said they told me to rehabilitate myself and I could go home. And he said, I'm not going to commit a crime to get out of here. And I'm not going to involve you in committing a crime, which would be paying a bribe. And I told him, I said, well, little Catholic girls <laughs> don't pay bribes. And so both of us, that code of behavior that we had between us, we exposed that pardon for sale scam. I called a cousin of mine who was a high ranking Republican in Washington, D.C., chair of the House Ways and Means Committee. And I said, look, can you please put me in touch with the FBI in Washington, D.C., because I don't trust any law enforcement in Louisiana at all. And so he did. And so that's how. I ended up wearing a wire for the FBI and meeting with this prison official who had asked for the $15,000 to help gather evidence. But in the end, because the system is so political, they released all the people who paid the bribes, committed the crime and gave them evidence, but not the whistleblower. And so, like Billy says, 20 more years it took us to get him out of there. You know, People find it difficult. I had journalists. I had religious people. I had political people. I was the only inmate in the Louisiana prison system who garnered the support of the New Orleans Metropolitan Crime Commission. That is one of the oldest, most established corruption fighting, crime fighting organization in the state. Their reputation is impeccable. The MCC made a courageous decision because of the exposure to pardon scam that Jody and I undertook to endorse my clemency and ultimately my parole release. So for the next 20 years, I had this crime fighting group that was back in my release. I had the support of two very law and order Republican congressmen. I had the support of organization, criminal justice organization, including NAACP. So I had incredible amount of support. So people would wonder, why can't this man get out? What is going on? 
Why is this case so politically volatile? The gentleman that I killed in 1965 in a convenience store robbery, that was an unintentional killing, and I'm not about to try to minimize that, that offense, was a star player on a high school football team in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That team at that time was recognized as the greatest football team in Louisiana history. The members of that football team and the coaches all gravitated, all those kids that were in the class with the victim, all gravitated to positions of local prominence in Baton Rouge, which is the state capital, in education, in law enforcement, in the prison system, in the criminal justice system. They gravitated to these positions of power, which give them access. One of the persons that played on that team was none of the time LSU only Heisman Trophy winner, Billy Cannon who went on to have a celebrated NFL football career. And in Louisiana, Billy Cannon was an icon. He was legendary. He was, even after he was convicted in 1981 of being part of and setting up the seventh largest counterfeiting ring in the United States history. He was still, after that time, extremely influential in politics and and Baton Rouge. He was convicted of that and he did time for, in fact, the uh, evidence, they dug up some containers of what? Counterfeit $100 bills, $500,000. On his property. So clearly he was absolutely guilty, but it made no difference. You have to understand football in Louisiana. I mean, it is, it is like the second coming. And all politics in that city, in the capital, ran through Billy Cannon. In fact, a local newspaper once had a story that said the road to political ambition in Baton Rouge started in Billy Cannon's office. That was a man behind the scenes who was orchestrating or in effect permitting other people in the opposition network to apply pressure on the decision-making process. I had five unanimous pardon board recommendations for release, and all of them were denied by different governors. And that's because a governor would not go against that local power structure. So when you factor in that kind of political opposition in a case, and I was once told by an attorney who's now United States District Court judge, that my case was probably the most politicized case in the history of Louisiana. It was not the crime. It was the politics. One of the victim opposition spokesmen would tell a local radio personality, Billy Sinclair's crime is that he killed a man with a million friends. And that was it in a nutshell. Sure, I deserve to be locked up and locked up for a long time. There's no mistake about that. There's no question about that. But the question became, and this was the question that was asked over and over and over again, why Billy Sinclair? What is it about this case that we have to hold him to a different standard than everyone else? Between 1992 and 1999, the Louisiana Parole Board paroled 72 inmates serving life sentence for murder. They served an average of 17 and a half years. Some of them were for double murder. Some of them were for particularly heinous murders. Some of them were previous death penalty cases like, like mine. And that is what, in a nutshell, Jody was up against. That is the life she stepped into. And if she had not stepped into that life, if she not fell in love with me in that death house in 1981, that spring, beautiful spring day in 1981, had she not done that, I would have died old beat man in a prison hospice unit in Angola. That's what would happen. She saved me from that fate. Well, I wasn't there was so much wrong in this case that it infuriated me and I was not going to back 
down. There is a saying, never fool with a Texas woman, which I, <laughs> I, have, I say that all the time. But you just don't walk away from someone who is uh, uh, being persecuted like that. That is the term that I would use is persecuted. And at the final parole hearing where he was granted parole, he was represented by a state senator, an African-American from North Louisiana, who stood up and told the parole board, this man should go home. This crime was manslaughter. It was not a deliberate, cold-blooded, premeditated murder. And because I think, you know, in Louisiana, it, it, it wasn't a conflict of interest for me to hire a state senator who was also a lawyer. Maybe in another state that might have been the case, but, but he was happy to take the case and I was happy to pay him. It was certainly worth it. But the parole came, you know, pretty much as a shock. And it was the 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 hearing was on a Friday. Billy was released on a Monday, which is unheard of. But that state senator wanted him out of Louisiana, wanted him in Texas, because I know he feared that behind the scenes, somehow they were going to come back and try to take away that parole. The two things that was working most time when you make parole in Louisiana is six to eight weeks before you actually release as it goes through a whole number of administrative processes. In my situation, there was two reasons why they wanted me out early. Senator Jones was concerned that behind the scenes, the opposition would be able some kind of way to queer the parole grant. So the parole took place on Friday. Well, you got to the weekend. So there's no government office or anybody at home <laughs> over the weekend in Louisiana in politics. So the correction system itself wanted me out because they did not want me sitting in their system, a high profile inmate, a celebrated award winning journalist, a FBI informant who had exposed all this wrongdoing and, and corruption. They didn't want somebody to kill me out of spite. So they had an urgent need themselves to get me out. And that's why that Monday, of course, I was shocked when the classification people came to me and told me you're ready to go home. We got your release papers here. <laughs> and I said, okay. She went through all the conditions and we signed all the papers. There were like six sets of documents. And she said, now you can leave. I said, I don't, I don't have nobody here to pick me up. 40 years of wanting to get out. And here I was stuck in prison with my wife in Houston, wondering how the hell am I going to get out? So I had a rush back to the dormitory, call my brother, tell my brother to call Jody and let her know they had just released me and I was sitting in the administration building waiting to go home. She had to rush out of her office, go get in the car and drive over and pick me up. And one of the little sidebar ironies of that whole situation is, is that we ultimately in the end paid Senator Jones $25,000 to represent me before the pro board. So the $15,000 we'd been offered to get out earlier, 20 years earlier, we didn't pay. And we had to pay $25,000 in effect to secure an honest release. And that is the way the Louisiana prison system works. And it's an example of the kind of politics in that Billy, you know, he was 20 years old, it's 1965. He was trying to leave the state. He'll explain that to you. He was trying to get some money so he could get on a merchant marine ship and ship out and be gone. And it was dark. It was nine o'clock at night. The clerk behind the counter had been one of those high school football players and Billy went in there and the guy refused to cooperate, came out from behind the counter, it was a 22, not a 38. 38s kill people. So he aimed at the floor and the guy said, yelled out, he's firing paper wads. And he advances again against Billy. Billy shot him in the leg, hoping that would stop the man, but it didn't. And so then Billy turned around and ran out of the store. And the clerk ran out of the store, also picked up a broom and was holding it over the top of his head, running in the dark across a parking lot with Billy. 
And Billy fired an unnamed bullet over his shoulder to scare this man. And it hit him in the armpit and traveled across the chest and nicked it as is a aorta and he bled to death. Now, there were four witnesses who saw exactly what happened and they were never allowed to testify at that trial. Instead, the prosecutor put a man on the stand who lied and he said that Billy shot that clerk down in cold blood inside that store. Now to flesh. And it was years later. And the, the one of the people who saw Billy running away was a state legislator and his wife. And years later, after that happened, I sent an attorney to get statements from them about what they saw. Tell this attorney what they saw and she would take it down. They told her, come to the house at night. We don't want anyone to see you. And so in secret, they testified to her and uh, signed the documents. We have them today. But that is the kind of thing that we were up against. The night the crime took place, previous to this robbery attempt, me and another fellow had pulled four or five robberies across a three-state area. And they were small-time convenience store robberies. I would, there was one gun between us, and he had the gun, and I would stay outside the store and serve sort of as a lookout. And I had never robbed a store on my own before this night, this, this robbery attempt took place. And I had a 22 pistol and it had a chamber that held six bullets. I emptied the firing chamber, left it empty when I went into the store because I didn't want anybody to get hurt. So when I went into the store, demanded the money, the clerk immediately shut the register and decided to resist a robbery. He came out from around behind the counter. And while he was standing there telling me to get out of the store, two customers walked in. I told one to get down an hour, which he did. I told the other one to stay put and he was there by the, by the door as, as he would go out the store. And I didn't know at the time, but he was a retired state police captain who knew the store clerk. And when the store clerk come around from behind the counter, I pointed the pistol at the floor and pulled the trigger. And he started shouting, everybody stay put, he's shooting paper wads, he's shooting paper wads. And so I backed up, I give ground. He took that, I think, as a sign of weakness and fear. And he started advancing toward me. So I shot him in the thigh. And I told him, just stay put. All I want to do is leave. Stay put. At the meantime, I'm trying to make sure these two customers are not by the door. And I'm telling them to clear out of the way. And he broke charged me. And I turned and ran from the store. Well, as I turned and ran from the store, he picked up a broom and was chasing me outside the store across the parking lot. I turned, sort of over my shoulder and fired a gun. And the bullet entered under the clerk's left armpit, traveled across the chest cavity, nicked his aorta, and he bled to death. Now, to understand the difference between murder in Louisiana, there was two doctors at the time. There was murder, and there was felony murder. Felony murder occurred when you harmed someone during a felony or an attempted felony. In this case, armed robbery. Well, in this case, the felony was over with. The felony had been abandoned. I had broke out of the store and ran and was running across the parking lot, and the clerk was shot outside the store. Well, manslaughter is both, in Louisiana 1965, was both intentional and unintentional homicide, dependent upon the circumstances. So a reasonable case could have been made that my crime was manslaughter by a good defense attorney, or at the very worst, a life sentence murder. Because either in, in 65, you either got death for murder or life, one or the other. There were no other penalty options for the crime. So there was a lot of political pressure being brought to bear that I 
that I'd be given a death sentence, that the victim's family demanded the death penalty in my, in my case. Before my trial, which took six took place six months after the, the crime occurred, there were four of the city's most prominent attorneys appointed to my case. Each one of them was forced off the case, withdrew, didn't want anything to do with it, too much pressure. On the day my trial started, I had two attorneys. One withdrew the most seasoned veteran attorney who had all the criminal defense experience, withdrew from the case, which left me with a civil attorney who had never tried a criminal case, much less a death penalty case in his career. There's 45 pages of trial transcript where the man stood there and told the court over and over again in every kind of way you could present it that he was not prepared for the trial. So the state was out for the death penalty. Well, the death penalty, once it was on the table, the prosecution had four witnesses to deal with. The gentleman, one of the gentlemen was inside the store, a clerk who was, another clerk who was standing outside the store sweeping the parking lot, and a state legislator, legislator and his wife who drove up as the crime was taking place as I was running across the, the parking lot. Each one of those four witnesses said they saw me run out of the store. They saw Biden charge me, the, the victim charged me, and I turned and ran outside the the store. So there were four mitigating witnesses who give a manslaughter version of the crime, and their statement was taken by the by the police. The man inside the store, that state police captain, who was retired, said that I shot the victim inside the store in the chest in cold blood, and turned around and casually and calmly walked out to a getaway car and drove away. His wife, who was sitting in their car outside the store, essentially said the same thing about the casual walking away. The other four witnesses were suppressed. Now I knew there were other witnesses there, but I had absolutely no way. I didn't have an attorney who could locate those witnesses, find out who they were. I didn't know anything about them. It was not until 1979 that I uncovered the evidence and the police reports where these four witnesses were there. So in effect, all the evidence associated with manslaughter was suppressed because there was that political need, the political demand to have the death penalty returned. And that stuck for years until 1979 when I was able to get the police report. It was after I got the police report that people within the decision-making process, the pardon board and the parole board, knew that it was not a cold-blooded murder. That's why five pardon boards recommended unanimously that I have my life sentence reduced to a specific number of years. That's why throughout my parole hearings, I got people voting for my, my release. But in Louisiana, to gain parole, you have to have all three members of the panel vote for you. If one votes against you, you can have two to one for you, and you'll still be denied parole. So throughout that whole process, that 40-year process, which is one of the reasons why the Metropolitan Crime Commission also supported my release, because there had been all this suppression of mitigating testimony, the use of perjured testimony. All these things were done in my case, to do one thing. That was to convict me and sentence me to death and execute me. Now, I escaped the death penalty, escaped the life sentence, and spent 14 years going through seven parole hearings before finally making parole in April 2006. So that's how the manslaughter issue was always a prominent thing in my case. And when Senator Jones at that last parole hearing made such an eloquent case to the parole board, and you have to understand on that parole board, there was a crime victim's advocate and there was a former sheriff deputy on that parole board. So two of those people were pro victims, but they listened to the arguments. They looked at my record, they examined the crime and all three of them said, 
it's time for this case to end. It's time to let this man out. And that's what happened. And then one other thing that the prosecutor was sanctioned and it wasn't the first time that he was sanctioned. And and because he did that in other cases, he had he had witnesses lie in other cases to get convictions. And so I think that that's that should be noted as well. What was the name of the group that sanctioned him? Was he disbarred? Yeah, the state bar. He was not disbarred, but he was sanctioned by the state bar association. Right. And then I I had filed a complaint against another assistant district attorney who repeatedly misrepresented the crime to the pro boards and the Louisiana bar sanctioned him and fined him for deliberately lying. In addition to the MCC, I was the only man in Louisiana where a court of appeals, a state court of appeals said that I was completely rehabilitated, that all the evidence showed that. But in Louisiana, as is the case in any state, because this is what the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled, that parole is not a right. It's a privilege. It's a privilege that the state can grant or deny for any reason it wants or for no reason at all. They have absolute discretion in determining who is released. And so that's what, you know, I was up against where people throughout the whole process recognize my my rehabilitation. All the, the prison system repeatedly over and over again recognize the rehabilitation. It's just that the politics of the case was the dominant factor that kept me in prison for 40 years. You know, you asked me about being the wife of someone on the inside. And I have enormous, enormous sympathy for any woman who finds herself in that position. But most of the women in that position, I think, are different from me. I had a master's degree in journalism from an Ivy League school. I had, even though I turned down a reporting job in San Francisco, a friend of mine said, oh, my God, take that job. Oh, my God, you did. it's impossible. You don't go from a small TV market like Baton Rouge up to San Francisco. And I really thought about it a lot, but I, but I couldn't leave him. I had to be near him because I knew what he was up against in terms of the politics. But because I had the education that I had, because I was able to hold the jobs that I got, I didn't find myself in the position that a lot of other women find themselves in. I never worried about a salary. I never, I had a supportive family. A lot of women don't have that. And a lot of women are on welfare. A lot of women just don't have the income. And a lot of women in the pandemic have lost uh, their jobs. So I was able to keep it a secret that I was, I just didn't discuss the fact that I was a prisoner's wife until Billy's autobiography came out in 2000. And I began to do some interviews, but it was a great day in my life. I was working for a top state agency uh, headquartered in Houston and the state agency was supposed to make downtown a wonderful place to live, work and play because downtown was deteriorating economically. And so the small neighborhoods around it were deteriorating economically. But the thought was, if you could get people to come back from the suburbs and you could live down da- and, and live downtown, then you could rejuvenate all of that. And so that's what I primarily worked on. But when the book came out, I went to my boss, director of the Houston Downtown Management District, and I said, Bob, this book has come out and I do not want to dishonor the district. It's too important. I don't want anyone to think ill of the district because I am the wife of a prisoner. And so he convened a meeting of the very top people on the board. We had a board of directors of about 30 people. Most of them were like the CEO of Enron and large corporations and stuff like that. Some of them were people who actually lived downtown. But the top uh, officials came and sat down at a meeting and I told them the story and I offered to resign because I did not want to bring any shame to the district. And to a person, 
they complimented me. They told me how wonderful they thought it was. And they sincerely wished uh, that the book would become very popular. So it brings tears to my eyes sometimes when I when I think of that, because it was not anything that I thought was going to happen. Uh, in the meantime, I did have a number of other positions over that 25 years, which were satisfying. And the wonderful thing about having those jobs I was still a TV news reporter for some time, working in some smaller Texas markets, but it took my mind off of what was happening to me and Billy, how hard it was. I had something wonderful to distract me. I could go out with a photographer, interview people, tell their stories. And that's one of the reasons that I love journalism. And when I moved out of news and could go into organizations uh, public service positions. Then again, I was helping people and it took my mind off of what I was enduring because twice a month I was making 400 mile round trips. I was driving from Houston to Baton Rouge and north uh, of there to Angola to see Billy for two hours on a Saturday. And then I would drive back and two weeks would go by and I would do that again. And then as a punishment, when they transferred him way up to North Louisiana, that was a 300 mile round trip. And I, I, I just couldn't do it twice a month. I, I, I had to cut it back to, to once a month and, you know, visit with him in a cell block. But I, as a prisoner's wife, I was very fortunate for the reasons that I just told you about. I had a feeling of accomplishment. I had a feeling that I was helping people, which made me feel very good. And nobody was castigating me or saying terrible things to me because I had married a prisoner. You know, as a collateral, while Jody was going through that outside and we were both experiencing on a regular basis, the disappointment of defeat, one denial here, another denial there. You have expectations of, well, maybe this time, maybe this time, only to be denied. And for me, not just her love, not just the commitment that she had for me and the determination she had to see me out, she inspired me to do everything I could do within the prison system to make it easier, to make a better argument for my release. Not only that I was the recipient of some of the nation's most prestigious journalism awards, the George Polk Award, that's the highest award that anyone can receive for magazine writing. I was the recipient of Robert F. Kennedy Special Up Special Journalism Award. I was a recipient of the American Bar Association Civil Gavel Award. I was a recipient of the Sidney Hillman Award. Those are all prestigious awards that reporters and journalists and writers in the free world do not have on their resume. And here I was an inmate. I had my writings published in newspapers, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, a host, a slew of newspapers across the country. I was published in law journals. I was published in, I was even published in the only inmate to ever be published in chief of police and police magazine. I mean, inmate serving a life sentence being published in two national police magazines. And when the some of the readers found <laughs> out, they protested and said, oh, we don't want some guy like that writing, you know, in our magazine. So after that, Billy didn't write for them anymore. But one of the things I think that has not been mentioned up to this point Billy sued the prison system over and over and over again. And he was able to do that because he was a self-taught, very brilliant paralegal in addition to being a wonderful writer. So what he did was um, help other inmates. And he was very successful helping other inmates get hearings and get changes in their sentences. He was never successful in his own. But one of the reasons that the system hated him so much was because he kept filing these lawsuits. And then finally at the end, uh, as he said, I was old, I was tired. And I wrote him a letter and said, you know, just let me 
let me guide the wagon. Let me work on that. Because by then he had serious uh, medical issues that I was afraid were going to kill him ultimately if I couldn't get him out of there, which I did. And those issues were ultimately taken care of. This podcast comes from Unincarcerated Productions and Grindle Industries. Every episode of Justice Delayed is produced and edited by Cameron Collins and Milo Bershane. Music on this episode is from Speculation. Learn more and check out Spec at speculation.bandcamp.com. That's S-P-E-K-U-L-A-T-I-O-N.bandcamp.com. And of course, head on over to unincarcerated.com to find out more about Unincarcerated Productions. We will see you all next time for part two of the introductory episode of Justice Delayed.